Welcome to the River Online Sermon. Now, if you've been following um, these online sermons at all for a while, uh, you will notice that recently my backgrounds have started to change. And, and what's happening is that rather than recording these at home like I used to do, I've been recording them recently in my classroom at Crown College. And what I'm doing is I'm sitting in front of the screen in which I usually show my PowerPoints, and I've been trying to put up a picture that either is church-related or crosses or something like that to kind of a low-tech way of making this look a little more professional. So I hope you enjoy it. Now, before I begin today, I want to make sure to uh, let you know that we have some online Bible studies and small groups that we do at the River. And if you are interested in being a part of any of those, uh, let us know and we can send you the Zoom link and make sure that you can access that. Uh, we actually have one starting up for the Lenten season, uh, in which we'll be looking at the life of Christ. And then uh, there's also one on the Book of Common Prayer going on right now. And, and so if you're interested, please let us know and we can make we can email you the Zoom link. You can reach us at riveralliancechurch at gmail.com. Now let me pray for our time together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to meet and for the opportunity to talk over this um, this online platform. Thank you for uh, the, the way that you are at work in people's lives. Um, I thank you for this, um, this opportunity to dig into your word. I pray that you would help us to be open to what you want to say to us. And I do pray specifically, Lord, that you would help me to be attentive to what you want to say through me, that I would not get in the way of the message you want to present, and that you would, um, that you would receive all the honor and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So how many of you have a sibling? And did you ever feel like you were compared to that sibling growing up? Did you feel like maybe you didn't measure up or that you were sometimes even overlooked? I remember growing up, my sister was 13 months older than I was. Uh, she still is, obviously. Um, but growing up, it, it, she, was, she was one grade ahead in school and she was an amazing student and she was very popular. And I, I remember it just wasn't always easy following her and kind of being in her shadow. Today we're going to look at a passage that has a couple of famous biblical siblings. And although we know far more about one than we do really about the other. Please turn with me in your Bibles to the Gospel of John chapter 1. Now, last week we wrapped up our 40-day prayer focus, and, and so today we're, we're, we're beginning a new sermon series, a sermon series that is um, going to take us not only through Easter, but even beyond that. Uh, we're going to take a look at the life of one of the most prominent figures of the New Testament, and through him we're going to be able to, to get an opportunity to look at the life of Christ and his ministry. Um, we're going to look at the formation of the early church. Uh, we're going to look at the spread of the gospel to other areas, and even some of the New Testament epistles through the, by looking at the life of this one guy. Maybe you can guess who it is. We're going to be taking a look at um, the life of Peter. So let's begin with this question. What comes to mind when you think of Peter from the Bible? So Peter is a very interesting figure, right? Uh, we know, we don't, w w there's a lot of information that we have about Peter, uh, both good and bad. Uh, the Bible doesn't hide his mistakes, and, and through the course of the series, we're going to take a look at some of the big mistakes that he's made, and the, we're going to look at the highlights of his life and the, the blunders and, or the life lessons that uh, he goes through. Um, so we are first introduced to Peter in a very roundabout way in the Gospel of John, chapter 1. Now, before I read this passage, uh, let me uh, just point out that the Gospel of John was uh, written by John, the disciple of Jesus. And um, that's important to note because in the passage we're going to look at today, there's another John that's mentioned, John the Baptist, and that's a different John. Now, Throughout John's Gospel, it's actually interesting, if you've not really read it before, you'll notice that he doesn't really, he doesn't refer to himself by name and, and kind of almost minimizes a little bit of, of his role in things and what's going on, um, kind of kind of like focuses on other stories and just kind of mentions him as like an other person or whatever. Um, but John begins his Gospel way back in the beginning of everything, speaking of how Jesus Christ, the Word, was with God and was and was God and was involved in creation. And then right after that, he, he 
talks about John the Baptist and, and, and his ministry and how he went before Christ and, and he was preparing the way for Christ as, as a voice in the wilderness crying out, make straight the way for the Lord. And actually in the passage right before the one we're going to look at, John the Baptist um, has Jesus coming toward him and, and he points Jesus out to his followers and says, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Uh, so he's pointing people to Jesus. And, and that ties in really well uh, with our passage for today. So um, let's, uh, let's take a look at John 1, verse 35, which picks up the very next day after what I just told us. So beginning, beginning in verse 35, it says, The next day again, John was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, come and you will see. So John the Baptist was hanging out with two of his disciples and they saw Jesus and John pointed to them and, 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 and or pointed to Jesus and said, behold the Lamb of God. So what does that mean, behold the Lamb of God? So this is a reference to Jesus as the Messiah, connecting him to the Passover and to the Old Testament sacrifices where a lamb's blood was spilt to, um, to care for the people. Um, like in the, in the Passover, they actually take the blood of the lamb and they put it on the door frames of the houses and, and all of that. And, and this looks forward to how Jesus would be the perfect spotless lamb of God who would be sacrificed for the sins of the world, uh, what he was going to do later on in his ministry. It's an important revelation of who Jesus is and what he came to do. And for two days in a row, um, John makes the point of emphasizing that and pointing that out to his followers. Remember, John was there to prepare the way for Christ. It wasn't about him. He wasn't trying to get glory for himself. So what was the reaction of the two disciples when they heard that John said about Jesus? Do you see, do you notice this reaction? They, what they do is they, leave John to follow Jesus. Now understand, uh, these were not just people who were part of a large group who had come out to, to hear what John had to say. These were his disciples, which brings up a good question. What exactly is a disciple? So basically a, a disciple is a student or a follower, someone who, who follows someone in order to learn from them, uh, to learn their ways, to learn how they do the things that they do uh, and the way that they do them and, and to be becoming like them. It speaks of commitment and devotion. So these disciples of John left him to follow Jesus. What do you think of that? So from a worldly perspective, that seems kind of hard to take, like the idea of leaving John to follow Jesus. But this was John's plan all along. It was his idea. He literally pointed them to Jesus two days in a row, declaring who he was. Throughout John's life, we see him exemplifying the idea that this was not about him. And his entire focus was to point people to Christ. So it probably made him full of joy to see his disciples leaving him to follow Christ. Now notice that Jesus asks them, what are you seeking? What do you think that means? So the word here means what are you seeking or searching for? What are you pursuing? Uh, what do you desire? Jesus wants to know their heart. He wants to know what they're after. You know, people follow Jesus for a whole lot of different reasons. Some, it was because they were intrigued by him or curious about who he was. Some, it was because they wanted to see the miracles that he performed. Others, because he taught with authority. Some followed him because they wanted something from him. Some thought they, that he was going to be the Messiah. Some thought that that some followed him because they wanted to be healed or to be freed. Some um, followed him to trap him. Jesus wanted to know why they wanted to follow him. Now, I think that Jesus already knew the answer to that, didn't he? So why ask the question? I think to some extent the question was really rhetorical in nature. It's not so much about him trying to find out why they were following him. It was more about um, them about him wanting them to search their own hearts, uh, to think about why they were following him, to maybe count the cost a little bit. Um, what were they wanting to get out of this relationship? Were, were they really wanting to follow him or not? You, know, you see, following him, following Jesus was not gonna be easy. So it's an important question for them to consider. And how did they respond? Well, they didn't really answer the question, did they? 
They just reaffirmed their desire to follow him. Or maybe they did more than that. Notice that they called him rabbi. What does that mean? So this would have been a term of respect, referring to him as a teacher or master. Uh, it, they might have been using it, using it generically to, uh, as a term of respect, a recognition of his authority, uh, but it could have also expressed their desire for him to be their teacher, their master. Notice also that they then asked where he was staying. To me, this seems to be like a desire for um, an invitation to come along. And that's what happens. Jesus invites them to come and see. Isn't that an interesting invitation? You know, um, we can take it at face value, come and see where I'm staying. But I see it more of a loaded, as a loaded statement uh, about their bigger question of, of why they wanted to follow him. This seems to, to me to be saying, Jesus saying, come and see. Not like, not trying to convince them about who he was, who he was or explain to them about who he was uh, or recruit them to follow him. He's inviting them to just come and experience him, to, to get a taste of who he is, uh, to, uh, to, to just um, like to be around him and get to know him. And if they will do that, they're gonna see who he is and they're gonna want more. I, I love that idea when it comes to evangelism, actually. Uh, that idea of, of um, inviting people to come and see Jesus, to come and get a taste of him, to come and experience him, uh, because that's what we, they need, uh, just, just to get a little taste so they can desire and want more. Now, you may be thinking, I thought this sermon series was going to be about Peter, and he hasn't even been mentioned yet. Uh, that's true, but let's see what comes next, picking things up with verse 39. So they, this is the end of 39. Uh, we kind of ended the last one with the beginning of 39. This is the end of thir verse 39. It says, so they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day. For it was about the 10th hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother, Simon, and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, the son of John. You should be called Cephas, which means Peter. So here we find out that um, one of the two guys who had been following John the Baptist and was now uh, leaving John the Baptist to go and follow Christ was a guy named Andrew. So what do you know about Andrew? So we don't know a lot about Andrew, actually. Uh, one of the um, most important things, though, about Andrew is simply that he was the brother of Simon Peter. Now, we're going to come back to Andrew in just a bit, but, uh, but notice that the other guy in this is not named. It's Andrew and some other guy. I just want to point out that some scholars believe that the other guy was John, uh, the, the disciple who wrote this gospel. Remember, John in this gospel doesn't call himself by name. Um, he, he sometimes refers to himself as like the one who Jesus loved or something like that. But he kind of minimizes his role a lot um, in a lot of different places when he's talking about things that he's involved in. So the way that he only mentions Andrew's name seems like it could fit. Also, notice at the end of verse 39, it mentions that Jesus, um, that they stay, that these two disciples stayed with Jesus for about a day, and it was the 10th hour. Now, that's a detail that seems a little bit unnecessary, like to just throw in the hour like that. Some scholars believe that this points to the idea that the other disciple um, with Andrew was John. And um, it's because this was his experience. He, he was it was it, he was talking about how he first began to follow Christ and he mentions the hour because this moment changed his life so the day and the hour had meaning for him that uh, it was his testimony now we don't know for sure that that's the way it is but it does seem like it, that might fit okay back to Andrew so what did Andrew do after be, um, becoming or going to follow Christ what, what was the first thing he did it says that he immediately went to tell his brother. And what does he tell Simon Peter about Jesus? He says that they have found the Messiah. So what is the Messiah? Now, obviously here it says um, the Messiah means the Christ, but then what does Christ mean? So 
Messiah comes from the Hebrew word meaning anointed one or chosen one, and Christ would be the Greek equivalent of that. So the two words mean the same thing, anointed one. And the idea of the anointed one carries with it the connotation of someone who has been set apart for a particular role. They've been anointed. Now, that could refer to a lot of things. A lot of people, you know, in, in, um, throughout the Old Testament, we see people being anointed or, or um, something. But throughout the Old Testament, this specific idea of the anointed or chosen one, the Messiah, is this idea of the one who would come to redeem Israel, one who is coming to redeem Israel. So Andrew and Simon, as well as all the other Jews at that time, had been watching and waiting for the arrival of this Messiah for their whole lives. They've been hearing about him and reading about him in scripture and all this kind of stuff, which means that the phrase, we have found the Messiah, would have been a very loaded, powerful statement filled with hope and promise. The way that he runs to tell Simon shows his excitement and his confidence that Jesus really was the Messiah. It also suggests that maybe Andrew and Simon were both seeking the Messiah. Not just that they had heard about the idea of the Messiah one day coming, but that they were actively searching for him and anticipating his arrival. Which also explains why Simon did not need a whole lot of convincing. He immediately followed his brother to go see Jesus. And what do you think of Jesus' response when he meets Simon? So first of all, notice that Jesus is not surprised to meet Simon. It seems like he's been expecting him. He calls him by name, Simon. And then he changes that name. Now let me ask you this. Um, is this like Jesus giving Simon a nickname? Like, okay, Simon, not a huge fan of your name. From now on, I'm gonna call you Rocky. Is, is that what's happening? Well, I think this is not really a nickname as much as a name change. Now, we see this happening at various times throughout Scripture with people like Abraham and Sarah and Jacob. There's significant moments that are not just about the change of their name, but the change of their identity. And it speaks of promise. Simon meant God has heard. Jesus changed his name to Cephas, which is the Aramaic equivalent of the Greek name Petros, or Peter, which means rock. It's a cool nickname. It's a great name change. But I think what's really impactful is, is when we start thinking of this as his identity and promise of what was to come. Rock suggests strong, secure, something to build upon. And we know that Jesus is eventually going to use that concept later on in Peter's life uh, with the formation of the early church. This is the beginning of Peter's story. There's a lot here and, and um, there's a lot that we're going to consider, a lot as we look ahead to the promise of who Peter's going to be. We're going to look at those things in the weeks ahead. But I wanted to start here for a very specific reason. As I mentioned earlier, Peter is one of the most prominent figures in New Testament, uh, in, in the New Testament. Did you know that he is mentioned 110 times in the Gospels and another 71 times in the rest of the New Testament for a total of 181 different mentions of him. He's a significant character, and there's a lot that we can learn from uh, as we look at his life and, and, and see not just like him, but also what he saw and what he experienced. And we're going to do that in the weeks ahead. But before we get there, I wanted to point out Andrew, Peter's brother. Not just Peter's brother, but Peter's kind of maybe overlooked brother. Peter is such a big deal, mentioned so often in the New Testament, that he eventually goes on, so he, he goes on to be not just one of the 12 disciples, but one of the, the three, like, inner circle, along with James and John, of Jesus' closest followers that get a specific close access to him, a position that Andrew never attained. He goes on from there and is, is one of the, like, the main figures in the early part of the book of Acts and then has a couple of letters later on, uh, and he's mentioned so many times. On the flip side, we know very little about Andrew. His name uh, means manly, uh, and his name shows up only about 12 or 13 times in the entire New Testament, and almost always just as part of a list. And most of the time, it says something along the lines of Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, or Simon's brother, Andrew, or something like that. 
It's kind of like he was the less important, less well-known brother. Like what he was known for was being Simon Peter's brother. And that's it. Like, aren't you, hey, hey, aren't you Peter's brother? Anyone resonate with that? Like I talked about at the beginning of the sermon. I, I, that idea of being in someone's shadow. Even in this very passage, before we're ever even introduced to Peter himself, to Simon Peter himself, we find Andrew being defined as Simon Peter's brother in verse 40. Like Andrew, you know, Simon Peter's brother. Even though as readers, we have not even met Simon Peter yet in this book. It's like John knows that we are going to hear so much about Simon Peter throughout, you know, if we read the, uh, the rest of his book um, and maybe other books, uh, that we're going to understand this when we look back and, and say, oh, okay, Andrew is Simon. It's like, it's like that's what matters. That's exactly what happens. We, we do as we go along. We, we know a lot about Simon Peter. And so Andrew, being Simon Peter's brother, makes sense to us. It is a reference point for us. We know very little about Andrew. But there is one thing that we do know from this passage. Andrew is the one who introduced Peter to Jesus. I'm doing an entire sermon series that is going to focus in on Peter and what we can learn from, from looking at him and his experiences and his life and, and as, as we follow his story throughout Scripture, uh, the impact he's going to have, the ways God is going to use him in spreading the gospel, the formation of the early church, and and all of the things that are going to happen. But I'm beginning this sermon series on Peter by pointing out Andrew, because Andrew is the one who introduced Peter to Jesus. Scripture is filled with little mentions, uh, with these, these, with mentions of of, uh, um, of of people like Andrew, people who maybe just appear as part of a list, or who maybe only show up once or twice, or or who maybe are not even mentioned by name, people who aren't even on our radar when we think of the important people from Scripture. Names that um, are hardly ever mentioned. Nobody bothered to tell their story. But even though, even though we may not really know their whole story, even though we may not know very much about them at all, does not mean that they were not used by God in amazing ways, like Andrew, who introduced Peter to Jesus. In the book of Acts, we see God using Peter to bring thousands of people to the faith. Andrew was probably involved in the early church and, and the spread of the gospel. But we don't know a lot about a lot of details about what he did. But we do know that he is the one that God used to introduce Peter to, him, to Jesus. And that's a cool story. Before we get into the amazing things that God is going to do through Peter's life, I think it's good to be reminded of Andrew and the way God used him to impact the life of one person. I find this story of Andrew inspiring, and it challenges me to consider what one person might God want to use me to impact? And what might God do through them? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I'm looking forward to talking about the life of Peter, but it's been really cool to dig into Andrew a little bit here. Lord, I pray that you would help me to see maybe that one person that you want me to introduce to you. Lord, may you accomplish what you want to accomplish. And may you be glorified. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.